The new millennium began with apprehension on the eve of Y2K. The fear of the millennium bug was that the computers controlling our economy, utilities, communications, and our defense systems would cease to function. When the ball dropped and the clock struck midnight, the world did not collapse into total chaos. The computer engineers had solved the problem with the programming overcoming our fears of the Y2K dilemma. But it became apparent that our civilization has become utterly dependent on our digital technologies. It is apparent that we are linked to our technologies and that our relationship with technology will continue as we go forward into the 21st century. Science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke once commented that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. The technologies that will be created in the 21st century will appear as magic. The most significant technologies that will be developed in the near future will vastly change what it means to be human. Technology is our history, and technology will be our future. I mean, I, you know, I'm an MIT guy, but they've never issued me my crystal ball. So I'm, I'm really reluctant to make large-scale predictions about where we're going. I think the, thing, the key thing to keep in mind, though, is not that we're moving, that it will be new technology that transforms us. What's going to be transformative is the interplay of all of the media technologies around us. Iteration after iteration after iteration of this project, you'll see more and more sophisticated uh, examples of the use of technology. Um, all around artistic creation, all around uh, a new way to express oneself. That, that's unknown. You know, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. All we know is how we can make the best future for tomorrow. Since the dawn of humanity, humans and technology have been intertwined throughout human civilization. Our relationship with our technology and our ability to manipulate our technologies has made us the most successful species on the planet. During the 20th century, we experienced a technology revolution with more technologies being created than all previous centuries combined. The Wright brothers and the Ford brothers changed the way we travel further shaping our world. It's a terrific race, ladies and gentlemen. The smoke and the flames now, and the flame is crashing to the ground, not quite to the mooring mass of the humanity and all the fans are just screaming around. World War II propelled us into a new era of technology that culminated with the invention of the nuclear bomb creating the fears of the Cold War era, launching us into the space age. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. A new era dawned when man landed on the moon as we set our sights on the heavens. The space race began in the 1960s after the Russians set the Sputnik satellite into orbit. In the 1950s, uh, when the, uh, the United States uh, was first uh, getting serious about the manufacture of, uh, of, of guided missiles, the, uh, the U.S. had, had planned uh, in celebration of the International Geophysical Year to, uh, to launch a, uh, a, a uh, guided missile 
called the Vanguard, which would place a basketball-sized uh, satellite into orbit around the, uh, around the Earth. Well, as the, as the U.S. made ready uh, its preparations to launch the Vanguard, uh, the world was, was staggered on a fall afternoon in, uh, in 1957 when the Soviet Union announced that it had launched a space satellite known as Sputnik. That satellite galvanized the uh, uh, community in the United States to produce more engineers. That made the, uh, the uh, education uh, really advance and produced uh, a lot of scientists, a lot of engineers. That has since declined. You can't hardly find anybody that wants to do hard science anymore. But the uh, space race, and in particular the race for the moon, did indeed engender a lot of uh, technology. Educators began to stress science and technology in the curriculum of American education as a result of the Soviet satellite Sputnik. In the 1950s, uh, consumer electronics still used a uh, technology uh, which is virtually unknown to us today uh, called the uh, chassis uh, and the vacuum tube. Uh, in the 1950s it came to pass that uh, the vacuum tube was replaced by the germanium diode and the, uh, and the transistor which was about you know one one hundredth the size and, uh, and did not have the, the difficulty that vacuum tubes had of, uh, of, of overheating. And this phenomenon was known as integrated circuitry using a printed circuit board with transistors uh, uh, mounted uh, in it and then the, uh, the printed circuit board could be, could be dipped in a, uh, in a solder bath and suddenly in a matter of seconds uh, the, the electronics industry had produced what previously took uh, many hours to, uh, uh, to manufacture. And so the advent of the transistor uh, led to uh, uh, the advent of the microchip and it was determined that transistors could be made smaller and smaller and smaller. And uh, it was at this time uh, that a guy named Moore uh, invented the famous Moore's Law, which uh, stipulates that the number of transistors uh, that can be uh, placed in a microchip will continue to double every 18 months. And this, of course, led to the uh, computer revolution. Uh, computers which previously had used uh, vacuum tubes and took up you know whole acre sized buildings uh, could now uh, be uh, placed in a, a container the size of a suitcase and as we know today uh, this, uh, this technology has continued to uh, its, its, uh, its trend toward uh, micro technology and uh, along the way, Moore's Law has continued to, to operate. And so that fundamentally what we're talking about is a doubling of the amount of, of raw information that can be stored every, uh, every 18 months, which when you look at this from the standpoint of a, of a, a person trying to master any given field, uh, this poses a, a, a problem of, of gargantuan uh, dimensions. And Moore's Law eventually, of course, will it, inevitably it has to cease to operate. But uh, while it's running, uh, the information explosion uh, continues. And really, the, the research that, uh, that needs to be done about the effects of Moore's Law on the human mind and on the, the human ability to process information. Uh, this research has yet to be done because we are right in the, in the throes of, uh, of this information explosion. Digital electronics, the internet, and the personal computer have greatly changed the way that we use our technologies. The advent of the personal computer has thrust us into the information age. Information technologies have changed almost every facet of our lives. The computer is at the center of digital technology. 
In the new millennium, computers will be everywhere and in everything. Futurist Ray Kurzweil projects that the digital computer will become as smart as the human mind by the year 2019. As chess grandmaster Gary Kasparov's loss to IBM's Deep Blue demonstrated, computers already surpass humans in some mental processes. There's two, well, at least two parts to intelligence. Uh, one part is raw computing power. And from that point of view, I think computers these days are, are approaching uh, sort of small mammal uh, size uh, intelligence. But uh, the other part is, um, what is the program of intelligence? And that's the biggest mystery for us right now. It, it, it may be that very soon we have the raw computing power of a human but unless it can be directed and uh, uh, adaptive and, and essentially do the right thing, uh, we won't have the intelligence of a human on a computer. And uh, a lot of us are focusing on making that happen, but uh, it, it, frankly, we don't know exactly the, you know, it's a big mystery, what is the program of the human mind? Computer programmers are mapping the human mind and modeling artificial intelligence after human intelligence. The computer's probably the most important appliance um, that we have right now. I mean, everything is becoming computerized. I, what I see happening with computers is um, uh, they're, they're going to become more ubiquitous. Um, meaning that right now computers are everywhere, but sooner or later they're going to be everywhere. They're going to be in your notebook paper, they're going to be in your books, they're going to be everywhere talking to each other. We're going to have massive networked computers. Um, there are issues with this. We are already seeing these issues arise with uh, the radio frequency identification tags, these sorts of things. Do we want to be so much online? I mean, Think about the, the way that we deal with uh, our communications right now. And that's what we're talking about, right? Uh, our ability to communicate. I think it's safe to say that the network has changed everything. Uh, I can't think of any aspect of how we communicate, uh, how we work with each other, how we conduct business, uh, how we engage in, in recreation uh, that hasn't been changed uh, by the internet. The network will significantly impact our future as our world becomes connected. Well, I think, I think we've seen a shift, so, uh, we've seen multiple shifts in our lifetime. I mean, I think we have, to, you can't understand the present shift toward connecting technologies without looking at all the ways we were disconnected from each other in the late, latter part of the 20th century. That we were disconnected by geographic isolation, we were disconnected by mobility. Alvin Toffler in the 1960s predicts we will invest less of ourselves in our communities and our friendships in the future because we, we become more and more mobile. We become more and more mobile as a society. The average American moves once every five years. They don't know the people who live across the street with them or next door to them. Into that picture, we then have to introduce the connecting technologies and the internet, the cell phone, uh, various handheld technologies allow us to maintain social connections with each other that in some ways overcome the isolation that was built up by cultural factors and economic factors, lifestyle factors. So on one level, yes, we are isolated in the sense we're talking to each other through technologies. On the other hand, we're nowhere near as isolated we, as we would be if we lack those technologies. Uh, yes, we have a smaller global uh, village um, than we did 10 years ago and certainly than we had 25 years ago or 30 years ago. But um, as I suggested earlier, we have at least two worlds. The, the world that is connected, uh, the global village, and the village that is uh, not connected, and that is the, uh, the disconnected world. The digital divide was a term that emerged in, in the 1990s to refer to the problem of access, and it was really understood primarily in technological terms. Who has access to the technology? North America 
and Europe are the fastest developing areas of connectivity with vast internet connections and massive network connections. As North America and Europe become connected, the rest of the world may be left behind in the digital divide. Perhaps in a more profound sense is dividing um, those who have high-speed connectivity and those people who are disconnected. Broadband internet connections are leading to the next revolution in the network. But that was sort of the beginning of, of all of this. Uh, what, what that led to then uh, was a project called Internet 2, uh, where we got initially about 25 or 30 uh, Research One universities together. Uh, that movement has now grown to uh, about 200 universities, uh, and they're engaged in creating what we call the next generation Internet. Internet 2 will be at the forefront of networking with its extremely large bandwidths, making real-time audio and video connections a possibility. Internet 2 will change the way we receive our media and the way we communicate. Medicine will greatly benefit from Internet 2. Haptic technologies will even allow surgeons to perform delicate operations through the Internet, improving health care for people in remote locations. We, we will have the capability of being able to, to, to perform that surgery with the best expert in the world. A physician or a surgeon at, at a New York or a Paris or a Chinese hospital. Um, the, the, the issue is low latency networks. It, it takes, from, from the time that I touch my hand until the time that my brain knows that I touched my hand is about three milliseconds. So you have to build sub three millisecond networks. The medical field is at the technological forefront with advanced technologies being created that improve the quality of life and the human lifespan. Digital technologies are allowing the medical industry to use cutting-edge high-tech tools. Computer technology is increasingly providing advanced instruments and monitoring devices. To have continuous monitoring of you know, somebody's heart as long as they're wearing you know, some sort of signaling device, the information could be sent out continuously to a to sort of a command post. Um, patients that have a history of either their heart beating too rapidly, already can have defibrillators put into their body that continuously monitor the heart. Um, monitoring the heart, if your heart goes into one of these rapid rhythms, you know, the defibrillator will turn around and shock you and, and get you out of that rhythm. Imagine that this pacemaker is a smart pacemaker as a little CPU in it. And so as I start to fall over and I'm falling down getting ready to kick my last, my pacemaker can call my cell phone and my cell phone is a smart cell phone so it automatically says, oh this is important and it calls the 911 or the emergency, emergency medical people. Well communication goes two ways. So as the, as, as the emergency, emergency medical people are coming to me they call my cell phone, which calls my pacemaker, and by the time those people get here, they have a full readout on what's wrong with me, which means they are, they are minutes ahead of where they would be if they just had to come and begin doing the analysis at that point in time. And those minutes can save a life. It's powerful technology. We have the ability of doing that today. In the future, Medical technology will be greatly improved, changing what it means to be human. Advanced instruments and tools will provide the ability to eradicate diseases that are now life-threatening. One of the most cutting-edge technologies affecting the future of the human body is genetic engineering. I think right now is a very exciting time, whereas um, the past couple of centuries were really, really exciting in microbiology and, and immunology, those fields. This is a really exciting time in genetics. Well, what is the 
What is genetics? Studying information in a, in a gene. What is gene? Gene is total DNA sequence comprised each individual organisms. Here we're talking about human being. That's how the human genome project got initiated to understand what's in a gene. This human genome project have has given us basically the, the code for all the genes that we have in our bodies and in, in knowing that we find out about a lot of diseases or genetic diseases that um, we previously had no, no clue of, of what was going wrong there. We can take um, these sequences from the genome, um, essentially destroy them in, in animal models and find out what, what these genes do, what they encode for and, and what that product actually does in the body. Watson and Crick discovered the DNA double helix model in 1953. Fifty years later, scientists were able to map the human genome, providing us with the code of life. Until uh, 1990, Real action did not really occur because we didn't have a technology available. And by 1990, um, uh, Congressional uh, Congress was able to fund it, three billion dollars for the project. And so DOE uh, and with other collaboration internationally, with like such as genetists in China, United Kingdom, and Japan, and etc., they were able to form consortium. Now that researchers have the code, they are beginning to understand what the code means. Genetics and bioengineering holds the promise of eliminating diseases. But there will be much controversy in the new millennium concerning genetics. Nanotechnology is another promising technology with the possibilities of changing the course of our future. I think uh, nanotechnology is also going to be a, a big player. It uh, isn't yet clear whether they're going to be able to overcome some of the uh, challenges to, to really make it work. Uh, but if it does, it'll offer the promise of um, uh, all kinds of uh, treatments uh, for our diseases. You know, you know, suppose we could have essentially little nano robots that can detect cancer and you just get an injection and they find it and chew it out, you know, for instance. Nanotechnology is technology that is on the atomic scale. If scientists and engineers are able to overcome the obstacles facing nanotechnology, it will provide us with the possibility of eliminating fuel problems, hunger, and many other human issues. I mean, nanotechnology right now are um, just uh, very pedestrian things. I mean, like those pants that you can spill coffee on that don't leave any stains. I mean, these are products of, of nanotechnology. Um, Drexler, Drexler's vision was more um, fantastical, you know, little nanobots building um, larger structures that are better and, than anything that we could have ever built. I think, I think nanotechnology is most alive right now in science fiction. Um, I still think we probably have a long way to go before we, we begin to see really kind of jaw-dropping um, applications for nanotech. The fields of artificial intelligence and robotics are technologies that are presently being developed that will have a vast impact on the very near future. This is Robot Rodeo, which is a national touring exhibit whose purpose is to show people what robots are and what robots can do and to break down some of the barriers. Most people think of robots as something that's pretty intimidating technology and yet the robots we have here are simple enough for the average person with some computer skills and a little bit of mechanical ability to assemble at home uh, or, or in their place of uh, work and to use for uh, reasonably sophisticated tasks. So we're trying to show people that it's not something that is 20 or 50 years in the future, but that's something that they can work with today. I think uh, we're, we're really on the verge of a, uh, uh, a revolution in robotics. Um, one reason for that is uh, a lot of the 
core technologies in robotics are, are finally there. For instance, uh, efficient motors, uh, very high power density batteries, uh, low power computers that can be embedded in the robots. Uh, we've, until now, not really had all those technologies ready to go. Uh, so that, that means that we're going to be able to have uh, autonomous robots that can take care of themselves, uh, at least from the hardware point of view. Um, th the big challenge I, I see is uh, creating the software there. In recent years, in the last 10 years, r robotics has made a big step forward, mostly with the availability of microprocessors. So now we can control the robots with a very small chip and we can program that fairly easily with a PC or, or a Mac. So tools that are available and inexpensive. Uh, and yet you don't see robots everywhere. They, they are sold for vacuuming your house or cutting your lawn. Um, maybe that's a valid use for a robot, but clearly we're just starting to scratch the surface. And I think we're going to need a couple other breakthroughs in thinking before they, they really start to impact people. However, embedded technology uh, and the manipulation of motion by computers, that's coming on very, very quickly. Uh, and we're starting to see that uh, embedded technologies in cars, it soon is going to be in refrigerators and stoves, it's going to be throughout the house. So I think from, from that point to the next point of controlling motion, which is what robotics is, is all about, that might be a, a, an easier step to take. Um. Also, we're going we're gonna to see, uh, I mean, we're already seeing it, but we're going to see computers embedded uh, and invisible in more and more places, and they're going to make all of our uh, appliances more intelligent and easier to use, and, and I hope uh, easier for them to work together and understand each other. Artificial intelligence is quickly becoming a reality as researchers develop the models of intelligence. Soon our technology will be advanced enough to rival human intelligence. I believe there are two schools of artificial intelligence. There's the top-down school, which, which talks about higher human cognitive functions like um, programming reason and programming um, what we consider to be human reactions. And then there's the bottom-up school of, of um, artificial intelligence that, that, that thinks about, well, we didn't start the, the beings that we are now, we evolve through time. And so the thinking there is that, well, we need to, f we need to model our, our, int our artificial intelligences on, on um, bugs or on yeast. The biggest question facing artificial intelligence is, what is intelligence? Yes, we still don't know about artificial intelligence. In fact, um, we still don't really know what intelligence is. Um, I mean, there are a lot of ways to define intelligence. Um, many would suggest that intelligence is just our ability to think faster <laughs> than you know, anything else. Uh, it's speeds, like massive parallel computing. So many suggest that artificial intelligence once we uh, get a computer that works as fast as the human brain, it will start to exhibit behaviors that, uh, that we might call intelligent. And so that's when, um, that's when we'll start, we'll, our, our relationship with our technology and our relationship with these systems that we build will, will inevitably change. As our machines become more like humans, we seem to be becoming more like machines. Futurists, hands, Moravec and Ray Kurzweil even speculate that we will be able to upload our minds onto artificial neural nets and possibly live forever within a digital domain. Well, the ultimate possibility is that uh, these technologies will enable us to live much, much longer. And in the uh, extreme, uh, we will gradually replace our bodies with uh, robotic parts and uh, you know if you break an arm you get uh, get a motor replaced um, the uh, the ultimate challenge there is what about our brains and uh, will we still need sort of the uh, the old-fashioned uh, wet wet technology that we have now or will we be able to go to a fully uh, uh, electronic brain um, I believe ultimately we we will uh, evolve to
to be robots and that we'll live essentially uh, forever. But it's going to take a while for that to happen. The possibilities of becoming physically integrated with our technology challenge what it means to be human. What it comes down to is if we're, if we're thinking about technology and how humans interact with it, um, can, we, can we remove one from the other? Um, I, I, no, it's, that's absurd. We are technology. We, we are what we have invented. We have become what we've invented, and, and we're going we're gonna to invent the tools um, to do that even, even more intricately this century with genetics, um, nanotechnology, and, and probably those, those types of, of applications. So we're going to become even more entwined with, um, with our technology. Uh, that's one of the things that some people here at Georgia Tech are working on is uh, how to create this interface between nerves and uh, computers. Um, there are other examples. Um, uh, there are artificial limbs that can be controlled by the remaining nerves in, in, a, in a person's amputated limb. So, uh, well, another good example is uh, pacemakers. Those are um, uh, implanted in the body. They remain for uh, several years before the battery has to be replaced. Um, and they monitor electronic signals uh, within the heart and send electronic signals. Um, those are just sort of things that are working now and sort of examples of how these interfaces can occur. The, um, the next big st steps, I think, are, are going to be uh, how can we deliberately communicate with computers with our mind. And uh, there, uh, uh, there are already examples of, of that being accomplished with uh, chimpanzees. Um, for instance, uh, there's an experiment where a chimpanzee can think about moving his arm and it causes a robot arm to move. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we're well on the way to uh, those sorts of things being possible. Uh, in the world that I live in, I, I tell my students, uh, if you can imagine it, then plan on it. Because if you can imagine it, somebody is probably inventing it someplace. And one of the most difficult things that humans have to do is, is plan for the future of technology. Because they're inclined to plan in the context of what they understand today. And by the time the plans become real, the technology is obsolete. And so you have to think about the future. I think science fiction is... Um metaphorically our window um, into understanding. Science fiction's always been good at providing a much needed distance. Science fiction provides us with the window where we can explore our fears and anxieties about technology and peer into the unknown possibilities of how technology will impact our future. A lot of science fiction um, allows us to approach our, our cultural anxieties, you know, anxieties about who we are. For instance, um, you know, when Alien came out, you know, this was, this was uh, body intrusion. Um, science fiction's always been concerned with that. What is technology doing to, to bo our bodies? And I mean, what are humans, um, what are humans more importantly than, than the body that makes us up? I mean, evolution, we can go back and look at what Kurzweil said, evolution has made us who we are, um, and we, we are developing the tools to change that, but science fiction allows us to look at these anxieties. Why, uh, what is this technology going to do to us? Is it Ironic, but it's true that the, uh, that the people in the 19th century uh, raised the very same uh, questions, and, uh, and we're still asking that, uh, that today. And, uh, uh, who knows the answer? We will continue to ask the same questions about our future and how technology is impacting humanity. And we will continue to redefine what it means to be human as we move forward into the new millennium. Mm -hmm.